So I took this picture of Whitehearn Estate from the backside, so Hunter Street. A lot of people don't even know it exists. I want to uh, show you what's inside and the grounds and uh, just a little bit about its history. Now I did film this mid-spring, so some of the annual flowers have not been planted yet, but there is a nice heart-shaped uh, uh, kind of foregarden in front of the mansion itself. So the mansion is a neoclassical style, which was popular at the time, built from uh, locally sourced stone, so limestone and other stones, but a very impressive structure when you first walk up to it. It was built in 1848 to 1850 for a local lawyer and city clerk, Richard Dugan. There you can see a little bit of the, uh, the front facade. So the thing that makes Whitehern very special is how well preserved it is. So not only the structure itself, but all the contents were donated to the city of Hamilton by the McQuesten family. So Dr. Calvin McQuesten in 1852 purchased the estate and moved his family in. One thing that you notice when you first walk in is kind of this purple hue coming from upstairs. And that's caused by the decorative window that's kind of halfway up the staircase, which, uh, you know, when you mix red and blue together, you kind of get purple. So uh, it, it kind of uh, casts that nice hue down the, the stairs and into the upper level as well. Quite a striking feature. And at the top of the winding staircase, you'll see a series of photographs. So the tour guide will explain kind of... Uh, you know, the McQuesten family was there for about 116 years and three generations, so a lot went on in the house. But uh, there's Dr. Calvin McQuesten. Now, he had married three times, so the, the first two wives there to the left uh, unfortunately passed away uh, fairly young in their 20s and 30s. But I was kind of interested about the middle picture of his second wife, Esther, how uh, kind of dour she's looking. But at the time, they told you to stand really still and not have any kind of uh, smile on your face, so... That was just the way, but interesting picture. This is one of his sons, Isaac, married to Mary Baker. Now, they had seven children, um, all who lived and died at the estate. So the one-third from the right, Muriel, unfortunately died when she was only 21 months. So the surviving uh, siblings are all there, and they each have their interesting stories, which I won't get into all of them, but I'll give you bits and pieces as we go. And interesting note, none of them ever married or had children, so... When the last son, Calvin, died in 1968, uh, that was the end of the line. And this is a foundry that uh, Dr. Calvin and John Fisher, his cousin, had uh, set up um, kind of Merrick Street and James, which is kind of Jackson Square area today. So this is one of the sons, Thomas B. McQuesten's room. When Thomas was Minister of Transportation, he oversaw the construction of the Queen Elizabeth Way. So there you can see the top hat he wore when King Edward and, at the time, his wife Elizabeth uh, they named it after her. So if you ever see ER on some of the bridges, like in St. Catharines, it stands for Elizabeth Regina. And this is a signed football by the Hamilton Tigers, who eventually became the Hamilton Tiger Cats. So interesting to see all the uh, personal possessions that were left behind. Um, nothing's reproduction. They said the only thing they had to um, replace sometimes is the area rugs or carpeting, just due to wear and tear. But uh, everything else is pretty much the way it was donated. So across the hallway is the room for one of the other sons, uh, Reverend Calvin. So you can see his hat and uh, part of his, uh, his clerical uh, wardrobe as well. And this, I believe, was the room for Mary Baker, so the matriarch of the family. Now, unfortunately, Isaac, her husband, died young at the age of 40. Um, he had alcoholism and unfortunately left the family bankrupt. But they believe he died of a, um, a sleeping concoction that he had overdosed on. Um, so yeah, she was left with six children to raise and an estate to run um, without very many uh, resources. So very strong-willed woman, uh, well known for her strong views and letter-writing abilities. And uh, yeah, that's what unfortunately happened. So they certainly had their struggles. Uh, one of the daughters, Edna, had mental health issues. Another daughter, Ruby, died young of uh, tuberculosis after uh, funding most of Thomas's education uh, working in Ottawa. So, yeah, not a very nice story at times. This was the daughter's room, so as many as four daughters were in this room at the same time. And um, Hilda, one of the daughters, uh, took care of her mother, Mary Baker, from this room. So she moved into this room, which is kind of in the center top section of the mansion. And there you can see at the end of the hall, that was Hilda's room. 
So very interesting to see the uh, second level and and understand what went on. Actually, if you go to whitehern.ca, there's uh, so much information on, you know, some of the achievements of the family and the struggles and all the um, the letters are, are published and available. So um, lots at the library to learn about. And another fascinating room on the first floor, just as you come in to the right, is the library with a lot of first editions and uh, uh, really an amazing uh, collection. And uh, interesting note, they do climate control this mansion. So, you know, all of these uh, books and um, uh, all of the materials in the house are preserved uh, using climate control. Even a lot of the uh, light switches throughout the house are uh, have been updated behind the wall, but uh, the actual switches themselves still are in use. And this is the drawing room, so kind of the most formal room in the house for a um, you know, special guest. A lot of this collection in this room was uh, bought by Elizabeth Fuller, which was Dr. Calvin's third wife. So she did a lot of shopping trips to Europe and the U.S., and she really uh, brought back a lot of um, um, higher-end uh, furniture and, and decor. So it's interesting to see... Uh, her influence on this house because Dr. Calvin apparently wasn't, uh, he was a little bit more modest. So I think a lot of the paintings and, and things were his, but um, some of the fineries were, were purchased by Elizabeth. And the way the house is set up now is meant to depict uh, around 1939 as it was back then. So here's the formal dining room and uh, the table is set for four, but that table does expand. For larger parties and it's interesting to see some of the similarities between Dundurn Castle in terms of uh, the faux wood uh, painting on the side of the, the side paneling so you'll see that in a second there is a term for it but I forget what it is but um, yeah this here so you see that in Dundurn Castle uh, at the time uh, that was uh, done quite a bit And then just down the hall is the sitting room, so used for uh, a little more casual conversations and game playing and things like that. Apparently they did have a TV later on after this time period, so the TV room. And also interesting to see, just like Dundurn Castle, there was a little bell you could ring for service. And from there you head down to the basement and I was surprised at how cozy it was. Um, lots of wood paneling and uh, almost cottage-like. So the decor is uh, very cozy compared to the upstairs, which is a little more formal. And that large fireplace has a uh, little oven too for baking bread. So like similar to a modern day man cave, I would say lots of books and uh, things to do and T.B. McQuesta was also very much involved in some bridges across the Niagara River, so there you can see some information on that. And these are some of the rooms in the basement, so it was very dry. I was surprised it wasn't musty at all. This is a kind of a cold pantry and work area. And this is light coming in from the front of the house and a little seating area. And a lot of uh, prints on the wall, and, and uh, this is a hand-knotted kind of rug of the Queen Elizabeth Way when it was uh, constructed. So a lot of personal items uh, hanging up that, again, these are not uh, reproduced. They're the actual pictures of the time. So a great kind of historical snapshot of Hamilton. Even, uh, you know, even the bathrooms are a, a, a snapshot in time. So this was at the back of the house before the addition. So this is kind of the add-on to the back of the house that was meant for the uh, live-in um, cook or the, the maid. Or maybe she did both, I'm not sure. But um, the one um, cook was with them for 22 years. She lived with them. And after the 22 years, she did uh, move on and get married. I think in her, uh, she was either 40 or 41. The tour guide said that uh, 
this was quite a modern kitchen for its time. So they did provide her with, you know, the latest uh, electric stove and a lot of uh, modern conveniences. I was actually quite surprised at how quiet it was for being right downtown Hamilton. I guess a, a thick stone building is going to do that, but uh, still surprising how quiet it was. They've done a really nice job of kind of keeping it uh, true to the time period. Now, Thomas uh, Baker McQuesten, who is one of the more well-known members of the family, like I was saying earlier, he was a lawyer, a politician, and a minister of uh, highways. He was responsible for many of the parks in Hamilton. So I, I think they said over 2,600 acres of park land, uh, including Gage Park. Uh, he helped uh, create and, and take over that from the Gage family. He also was responsible for uh, the RBG and setting that up. Um, so we have to thank for a lot of uh, the naturalization and beautification of Hamilton in terms of parkland and infrastructure. He did a lot of the bridges in the area and the Niagara River and uh, the high level bridge next to Dunder and Castle there. This is the back garden. So this is not part of the tour, but it was done. And then I was just allowed to walk back here. It is open to the public too. Um, I did not film the back gazebo because there were a few people sleeping there. So yes, it is a city park and it is open to everyone. So just be aware of that. But I just did a quick uh, walk of the back of the garden. It is a walled garden, so uh, kind of nice little oasis. And all these plants are, again, from the time period of around 1939 or earlier. So yes, this was mid-spring. Everything was just coming up. But nice, nice garden. You would never know that there's a busy street right on the other side of the wall. So it was declared a National Historic Site in 1962, and the city took it over in 1968, and it was open to the public by 1971 after some restoration. If you're planning to visit, uh, I would book online, and if you have a valid library card from the city of Hamilton, as of the time of this video, it, uh, there is no charge for admission. So uh, I encourage you to venture down. It's right next to City Hall. Um, if you're looking for free parking on the other side, so south of Hunter Street, on some of the side streets there, there's two hour parking. So the tour is one hour long. They also used to have some special events held in this back uh, garden as well. So the tour guide said, uh, because of the pandemic, things are slowly getting back to normal, but she had no uh, idea how, how long it'll be before um, there'll be any special events. So stay tuned for that. So there you can see it's all very close, as well as the Canadian Football Hall of Fame, so right across the street. There you can see some signage about current events or rentals and hours. And then the plaque that explains the uh, this historic site itself. So thanks for watching, everyone. Please take a second to hit the subscribe button. I appreciate it. Stay tuned for more videos and bye for now.